Good. So today we'll we'll be uh, doing the last of the Satipatthana of the resting places of awareness. We'll just try this in our meditation. And of course these are very lightly touched upon. Uh, it's very uh, uh, short um, contact or try with with these meditations only for half an hour of course we cannot do the do a whole exercise or a whole retreat on them but it's good to also simply know that they're there and that we can um, have a bit of an idea what they are and uh, today's talk will be touching a little bit about this not not exactly but we'll see a little bit more at the end uh, did the uh, link sharing work I didn't look What do you mean link sharing? Oh, I didn't, I forgot that part. Oops. Sorry. That's okay. okay I, I will, um, I'll do that. You go ahead. I just got your email saying that you would do it. <laughs> I know, but then I forgot. That's okay. No problem. Um, anyhow. And t yeah, tonight, tonight's talk will be more about um the scale of um meritorious deeds and or the scale of goodness in actions that we can do and what is the most meritorious or good actions that we can do and this is the story of Valama the the brahmin who gave this big offering and we'll explore a little bit more later and so Right now I invite you to relax and close your eyes. Perhaps take a deep breath. And let it all go. Whatever you are doing today, what your plans are for tomorrow, allow your mind to be free here and now. And there is no quicker way that I know of to liberate the mind here and now than a smile. And feeling, simply feeling this smile, this joy. this natural expression of happiness, of joy. The keystone of the seven factors of awakening the one that holds everything in place 
in its right place. That keeps mindfulness from collapsing. but to remain strong and supportive. Perhaps you feel your entire body. And its awareness is slowly bubbling up. as we are relaxing with a smile, with joy. Really enjoying letting go, enjoying meditation. Yes. Don't be afraid to really smile and to really enjoy. Nobody's actually watching. And notice how quickly the mind becomes collected when you just Allow that joy to pervade your whole body, to pervade your whole being. It doesn't matter what happened, 
who did what to who, when, where, how, why. What really matters is that we can be happy here and now. Forgive all of those who give you problems, all of these unwanted situations. Just let it go. You are here now and everything is good. Interestingly, the word atta in Pali bears this dual meaning of purpose and happiness. The purpose is happiness. Now perhaps you notice there's all kinds of things happening in the mind. There's all kinds of states, contents, phenomena, that can be categorized. Or understood. as they are. Whether it's either one of the five hindrances Whether there's some longing for something,
maybe you've had a long day at work and you'd like some ice cream and there is longing for ice cream that arises and all of a sudden you want to get up and go to the fridge just notice notice the pull notice that in fact this is a hindrance you were happy smiling here now but there is a call for ice cream which is going to make you break your sit you can have some after and to know and see when longing arises for anything the mind is not freestanding anymore in joy in the smile with the meditation it is going towards another object something that it fancies from right awareness to wrong awareness or wise awareness to unwise awareness being happy with whatever happens to really wanting something and that's going to make us happy and to know how to release it to see how it brings up this tension this distraction of awareness in the mind and the more we feed our awareness to that distraction the more we give it power and the more we will grow discontent with what is now so we see this we see the tension and we let it go we smile oh mine really wants ice cream now we see it for what it is by smiling we stop taking it so personal we don't build it into a conflagration we relax smile we know how it comes to be released and we know how slowly it stops arising because we build a cradle of contentment for awareness to rest upon with joy
whether it's dislike that arises in the mind, impatience, someone that you saw today that made you upset, simply knowing it for what it is, it is simply a distraction. You're happy in the second later, impatience. That's fine. We see it, we notice it. We know how to release it, to let it go, to come back to the meditation. Not take it personal. For a second, we took it personal. We saw the hurt we were causing ourselves. We let it go. Smile. Maybe it's restlessness, a lot of thinking. It seems like it doesn't stop. Sure. We let it go. We know the release from it. To indulge in it would only be feeding it. We relax, let go, see the tension, and smile. Maybe there's doubt whether this technique works or not. Doubt is another distraction. Another hindrance to a clear mind, wichikicha. It cannot settle because it doesn't have that confidence. But the trick is that itself is what is distracting the mind away from being able to experience the meditation. So we let it go, we relax, smile. Oh, when there's boredom or laziness same thing these will all pull you away from being happy content and experiencing jhana And to know them and to know how they work, to know how to recognize them. Is a great power. When impatience arises, it doesn't matter what the object is. What matters is that we know this is impatience. This is unskillful. 
This is longing. This is a distraction. This is doubt arising. This also is a hindrance. This is boredom arising. This also is a hindrance. And when these five hindrances leave, become very weak, the mind becomes very bright and very happy, uplifted. With faith and dedication, we continue to smile and to let go of tension and distractions. Or perhaps one might notice forms or shapes or lights and colors, forms, rupa. The first fabric of the ego, one of the first, one of the five constituents that we call ourselves. Form or shape, sensations, perceptions or concepts. Mental fabrications, the active part of the mind, sankara. Or simply awareness. Perhaps mind is aware of one of these in particular. And how it is arising and passing. Arising. passing. And to see this we need to in fact continually let go and smile and detach. find great joy in not grasping, not holding, to develop this samadhi the Buddha called 
Anantarikanya or Anantarika. Uninterrupted. It does not latch to any particular thing. It just sees it passing away. Like looking at a river, it might seem like some parts of the river are fairly stable, some shapes, the water going around the rock. some kind of V-lines that the current is making. But the reality is that that river is just continually passing. So too are forms, anything that is felt or experienced, sensations, anything that is cognized through memory or conceptualizations, arising and passing away. Any active fabricating manufacturing or propagating or proliferating of thoughts sankara and even awareness passing passing smiling not holding Perhaps it's any kind of experience at the any of the six senses. Whether it's at the eyes, which should be closed. But this is also working for everyday life. whether it's the nose and smells, whether it's the ear and sounds, whether it's the tongue and flavors, the body and tangible things, mind and mind objects. We know the arising of contact, the arising of sensation and notice if there's any tension arising or not and letting it go understanding the release from tension at any of the sense doors smiling relaxing
Maybe it's one of the seven supports of awakening. Maybe there is awareness. Or maybe there is not really good awareness. Whatever it is, we are simply aware of what is. We also know how awareness comes about and how it is maintained. By letting go and bringing up joy, smile. Whether there is discernment or not, and noticing if there is, there is, if there is not, there is not. Understanding how discernment comes about, discerning between a happy, uplifted, wholesome, aware state of mind or a distracted mind. Being able to tell these things apart. And knowing how discernment comes to be maintained. How inspiration comes about, if it's present or not so present. And to know how inspiration or determination is maintained. To know if joy is present or if it is not present. And by now you should know how it comes about and how it is maintained. Similarly for Calm, tranquility, similarly for collectedness, and similarly for steadiness of mind. Whether they are present or not present, to know how they come about, how to bring them up, and how to maintain and cultivate them. Or whether it's the Four Noble Truths, the Four Understandings of the Awakened, To know this is tension when it arises. 
to know its source, its cause. A distraction. Distractions come with tension. And to know its release, the most important of all of them. If we only know dukkha, we do not practice the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha's teaching is also mainly dukkha niroda, the end of tension, of trouble. We let go, relax, smile. And this is the fourth noble truth. Knowing the path, discernment, knowing states, what are wholesome, which ones are unwholesome. Cultivate the wholesome states that is wise intention intention of letting go of love and compassion and calm contentment Naturally, this will flow in the virtues, how we behave ourselves with our bodily actions. And with all this, we can meditate, let go of unwholesome states, Cultivate wholesome states. See things as they really are with wise awareness. And navigate our way through the jhanas to liberation. All of this pointing at, letting go, smiling, not getting involved, being wise and discerning, seeing things as they really are, not becoming emotionally distressed about a hindrance, it is simply a hindrance. We let it go, smile. and relax and to deeper, steadier awareness. And like this, the mind is seeing clearly. It is seeing things as they are.
free. So today was a bit of a longer meditation. Which closes our eightfold concise instructions of the Brahma Viharas and the Satipatthana. And now we have hopefully a bit of a clearer understanding about what these practices are and to wrap up this eight session long teaching I will be reading a sutta which is a very, uh, to me, this is a very essential sutta that is about the scale of good deeds or meritorious deeds. And it talks a little bit, well, in fact, it, it talks about what we've experienced for these eight sessions and put puts things into a certain perspective as to um, give us an idea to know what what things are most wholesome in our lives to practice so that we can in fact know what is the most meritorious thing that we can do and well it's no wonder it's always meditation <laughs> But um, to this sutta is very wonderful because it really puts it very clearly and uh, makes it very uh, quite, quite clear and quite wonderful. Um, and so that we can keep this in the back of our minds and as a tool for us. Because to know how the highest merit is done, this will really help us in our lives. <laughs> It's like uh, knowing where the gold is. <laughs> you don't uh, lose your time scratching here and there on these rocks and things like that. You just go for the gold. <laughs> so, uh, it's, uh, it's a quite wonderful sutta and to, to bear in mind and to bear close in our, in our pocket here. So, this is Velama Sutta. And um, this talks about uh, the Brahmin Velama, and this is a past life of the Buddha. So, uh, this is at Sawati, and the, the teacher lived in Prince Jetta's grove at Anathapindika's monastery. And at that time, the follower Anathapindika went to the Buddha paid loving respects and seated himself before him. Then the teacher asked, Are alms given in your family, Anathapindika? And Anathapindika was a very, very wealthy man and he was the chief supporter of uh, the Buddha Sasana and the Buddha and the monks. He was known to distribute uh, I'm not sure if the, that number is very accurate, but about he gave this Jetta monastery. He he's the one to lay all the gold down uh, to cover the whole of Jetta's grove to buy it from the prince, and the prince thought he was mad, but he did it for the Buddha, and he thought this is the best thing that I could do with that money, and then he. Uh, he, it's it's one thing to set up a monastery. It's another thing to feed the 2,000 plus monks that are residing there. 
<laughs> so <laughs> he was he was also known for feeding these monks. It's like carts and carts and carts of food every day. So it's so the Buddha. I'm saying this because it's an interesting question that the the Buddha is asking. He's asking Anathapindika if alms are given in his family. So just so you understand a bit the context here. My family offers alms, Bhante, but theirs comprises inferior quality rice crushings mixed with bran alongside with sour gruel. And at that time, this is the poor, poor people's food, what arguably would, would also be today. Anata Pindika. Whether the offering is rudimentary or excellent, those who offer carelessly, without respect, not from their own hand, that is to, what is to be thrown away, not realizing that something good will come out of their action. Whenever the result of their offering revolves back to them, their minds do not rejoice, even when they receive the best of foods, the best of clothes, the best of transports, and the best of the five senses and their objects. Their sons and daughters, wives or husbands, and helpers, attendants and workers will not pay attention. They will not listen to what one has to say, nor will they attend with a caring mind. Why? Because this is the result of actions done carelessly. Whether the offering is rudimentary or excellent, those who offer thoughtfully, respectfully, from their own hand, what is not to be thrown away, realizing that something good will come out of their action, Whenever the result of their offering revolves back to them, their minds rejoice when they receive the best of food, the best of clothes, the best of transports, the best of the five senses and their objects. And see the Buddha here was also not always saying, um, and this is an interesting thing, even though we all know that meditation and jhana, the way that he taught, was about letting go of these uh, five cords of sense desires or distractions outward. We can also clearly see in a lot of suttas that he was also say, uh, referring to enjoying things in life. And so it's quite interesting. And often we have teachings that uh, really uh, tell us, no, you can't enjoy anything. Like that's bad. <laughs> that's a bad thing. Because then you're craving or something like that. This is true in, in a certain way, but not all the time. And we need to be wise. We need to make that, draw that line. Where the Buddha, yes, it's not, it's not wise to always invest all of our happiness in these things. Because a lot of these things can be taken away. But as here he is mentioning, in fact, a, a lot of uh, the generous people who offer selflessly, that kind of mind will also, whatever, because that merit is great whenever that action returns to them, they have an uplifted mind anyways. So they will enjoy whatever comes to them. So that's what, it's me that, that's what it means. And it doesn't mean that we are really longing or wanting or craving to use that word for a certain thing or not. But it is the nature of an open, kind, generous mind to just enjoy whatever is happening. So it's not true that we have to cut away the joy. In fact, that's completely opposite to his teaching. And uh, in fact, it's about learning 
how to be skillfully joyful and how uh, which kind of joy will last for us and which will not and once we learn that that's a very great gift <laughs> Their sons and daughters, wives and husbands, and helpers, attendants and workers will pay proper attention. They will listen to what one has to say, and they will attend with caring minds. Why? Because this is the result of actions thought, done thoughtfully. There is also this uh, dichotomy or uh, that exists where the Buddha teaches a teaching of karma, of actions, that we should understand karma, that we should understand actions have their result, and we should understand that wholesome actions will bring about wholesome results. But also he said that this is there's three things that are impossible to know for sure in, or to comprehend or to understand fully in this world is the mind of a Buddha, the mind of an Arahant, and the inner workings of karma. <laughs> so there's this dichotomy where the Buddha says you need to understand karma, but then it's un. un <laughs> Un inunderstandable. <laughs> um, so, I guess I am saying this because, I, well, recently there was a few comments on this, and I thought I would clarify that we we do we should train to understand karma and understand the result of bad karma and the result of good karma, mental, physical, or verbal and to train towards the wholesome to understand why because our mind become uplifted becomes joyful and that kind of mind is aware but there is also the side where we don't want to make too much of a big deal out of every little single karmic relation that we can experience because we simply cannot know all of it. It's a bit more complicated <laughs> than just what we can compute. <laughs> so uh, there's many, many, many variables, and uh, today we call we call that uh, algorithms. <laughs> so, okay. In the past, lived the Brahmin named Velama. And on one occasion, he carried out an offering, an extraordinary act of generosity. He offered 84,000 golden bowls filled with silver coins. 84,000 silver bowls with, filled with golden coins. 84,000 bronze bowls filled with golden nuggets. 84,000 elephants with golden ordnance adornments, golden flags, covered over with golden nettings. 84,000 carriages, covered in lion skin, tiger skin, leopard skin, delicate saffron fabrics, with golden trinkets, gold, golden flags, covered over with golden mesh. 84,000 cows dressed in silk outfits and bronze milking pails. 84,000 couches covered with deep hair fur carpets. White wool coverings, woven coverlets, Kadali deer spreads with sunshade canopies and crimson cushions on either sides. 84,000 measures of the finest fabrics, the finest linen, the finest silk, the finest wool, and the finest cotton. And what to mention of food and drinks, chewables, eatables, lickables, and drinkables, they seem to flow like rivers. 
One might think that this Velama was a myth, a myth, or someone unrelated. But this is not how it should be understood, Anatta Pindika. At that time, I was the Brahmin Velama. I was, it was me who offered this extraordinary offering. But there was nobody truly worthy of offering. Nobody that could purify the gift. And see, this is another thing that he talks a bit more in greater details in other suttas, like the Dakinaya of Vibhanga in the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, which I won't go into greater depth today, but there is m many sides of an offering, and uh, the, an offering can be purified by the giver, it can be purified by the receiver, and of course, it can be purified by both. And that means, um, in very simple, simplified terms, um, that is put to a good cause, but this is a very uh, bad uh, way of saying, saying this, or there's much more to understand. Even if the Brahmin Velama had only fed a single person graced by wise understanding, it would have been much more beneficial. Much more beneficial than feeding a hundred people attained to the Dhamma vision, it would be to feed a single one's returner. Much more beneficial than feeding a hundred one's returner, it would be to feed a single non-returner. So the difference here is someone that first has seen the Dhamma, seen, has abandoned doubt, has gone beyond doubt in the teaching, and gone beyond blind beliefs into uh, rites and rituals. Uh, bringing to liberation, Nibbana. And the theory of a self-view. And a once returner is someone that has diminished greatly uh, sense desires and anger. And a once-returner, uh, a non-returner, is a person who has completely cut away, completely uh, sense desires and anger, or dislike, um, however you want to call it, ill will. So this, a non-returner a non cannot become angry. <laughs> in, the, in the simple way to put it, a non-returner cannot... Their minds cannot be affected, whatever sense, uh, sensory input is happening, their mind isn't uh, longing for it, or it doesn't get distracted, it doesn't, it doesn't get phased by whatever experience of the senses, and it does not want any particular experience of the senses. It eats because it has to keep the body alive, for example. It, it wear clothes because it needs to shelter the body. But mental steadiness and clarity and purity of mind is so strong at that point. Uh, wanting for anything at the senses, for them, would just not make any sense. It would be like putting your hand in the fire. <laughs> we just don't do that because it sounds ridiculous. Well, that is the wisdom of uh, non-return. These things and anger, anger, it simply cannot arise. It has been seen with wisdom with such profound depth. It has been cut at the root, made like a palm stump. It cannot grow anymore. It cannot arise anymore. So, there's not even the ground for any kind of anger to germinate, to take root in them. 
because once again it would be like for them putting their mind their their mind in the fire yes exactly their hand in the fire it would just be painful and why would they ever do that to themselves and these things they're still painful uh, to the people who are experiencing it but the thing is that we don't we don't see that always and there's different levels of that and I'm explaining this so that you understand why this is uh, getting higher and higher or um, m more valuable as it goes is that supporting uh, or offering something to someone who has completely cut away anger is quite amazing whatever is going to come out of that person well it's not going to be anger for sure and it's not going to be uh, uh, any of the sense desires is there's not going to be any craving for something uh, that they can you know buy and enjoy for themselves or because it's good or something it's it will be just the wisdom of having attained that state is quite profound so when the offering is made that is purifying the offering because it cannot go to any of these unwholesome states so and this is also why I said this is a good sutta to keep in your pocket because it the understanding of it is over a lifetime and so it's not in one talk that you we understand everything but it's by remembering the sutta in some occasions and remembering oh yes maybe that's true and see how it works and see how how uh, this scale of goodness works much more beneficial than feeding a hundred non-returners it would be to feed a single arahant and a, uh, an arahant is one who has cut away pride completely so when pride is gone that means the sense of self the uh, the name is in the the messages I think so Uh, an arahant is simply their wisdom is so profound they there's no state unwholesome state that can arise from because all these unwholesome states are rooted in ego in self in pride conceit mana and once this is uprooted all these other unwholesome states they go because that's the ground for them to grow into and so someone that has completely let go of that and that's not always a very easy task but it's uh, it is possible and that is why offering to a person like this is a quite quite a truly wonderful opportunity much more beneficial than feeding a hundred non-returners a hundred arahants sorry there's a mistake I made it would be to feed a single silent Buddha this is a Pachika Buddha there's, uh, there's a few kinds of Buddhas but uh, Pachika Buddhas are not like Gautama Buddha they're Pachika Buddhas they awake to the Dhamma by themselves without a teacher but they cannot teach they do not teach it to the world that's why they are called a solitary or silent Buddha much more beneficial than feeding a hundred silent Buddhas it would be to feed the truth finder the Arahant perfectly all awakened Buddha that is like Gotama much more beneficial than feeding the perfectly all awakened Buddha Sammasambuddha 
It would be to feed the Sangha of monks headed by the Buddha. So that's here, um, you, you get to hear why uh, in Buddhism, people, when they offer things to monks, they never really offer things to a particular monk in, in uh, itself. They always offer to the Sangha with the Buddha at its head, because that's the most meritorious act of giving. And when you give to a monk with this kind of mind in the background, this is the highest merit that you can make uh, by giving to the Sangha or to a particular monk. Even the Buddha, when some people came to him to try and give something to him, he said, offer it to the Sangha, offer it to the whole Sangha. There is nothing, he said, there is nothing more meritorious then uh, never is an offering to an individual more meritorious than many individuals, and especially in the Sangha. So he always praised to do this and to have this kind of mind. Because the generosity, it might seem like a bit splitting hair, but it, it, does, it does work quite, nice, quite well. Much more beneficial than feeding the Sangha of monks headed by the Buddha, it would be to build a vihara or a monastery or a place to dwell dedicated to the Sangha of the Four Directions. Much more beneficial than to build a vihara dedicated to the Sangha, it would be to go for a refuge to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha with a confident mind. And see here, this is not just uh, me telling you. <laughs> you should take refuge, Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Well, yes, you should, but uh, it has to come from you. <laughs> and it has to come from understanding, confident understanding in the teaching. And that's where the power of that merit comes from. It's not when you just do it on, on a fling like this. Uh, it's, it has to be with a confident mind. But when that is done with a confident mind, the Buddha says it goes beyond all of this, all of these offerings that you could do to the Sangha. And that's when the, the, this sutta becomes very interesting. You will see. Much more beneficial than to go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. With a confident mind, it would be to undertake the training in virtue with a confident mind. That is, refraining from hurting living beings, refraining from taking what is not given, refraining from sexual misbehavior, refraining from speaking lies, refraining from mind-altering substances. And see, now it's getting a little more interesting where uh, it's one thing to go for refuge and to undertake the actual physical training in the virtues is quite meritorious, more than offering a monastery to the whole Sangha. <laughs> so this is quite helpful for us to know. Much more beneficial than to undertake the training in virtue with a confident mind, it would be to develop a heart, of, a heart and mind of love. This is metta. Even just for the time it takes to notice a passing scent. And so this is how the, at the time of the Buddha, there is no watch, there is no, there is no you know, seconds and minutes. So... Uh, their measures of time is a bit different. But this is quite uh, interesting to, to know that if you were to simply bring up love in your heart genuinely, and, well, at this point he doesn't specify to all living beings or just love uh, inside your heart, but just to do this for a very short period of time, it overrides everything else. <laughs> well, 
I mean, it's still, it's still very meritorious to feed a Buddha, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have that chance today. So, uh, but everybody can bring up love, so I strongly encourage you to, <laughs> to just go, go all the way up. <laughs> and yeah, not, not waste your time in regretting. And thus, Anatta Pindika, much more valuable than all of this. And now there is this great enumeration of all the things that I've just said, which I'm not going to repeat again, but you can do it in your mind. And to remember that all of this that I just said, all of this, it would be much more valuable to cultivate an unabiding mind. And this is Anicca Sanya. This is usually translated as the perception of impermanence. But, uh, uh, like I explain here uh, in the note, I take this translation from a uh, nitya. Nitya is um, staying or uh, lasting or permanent or constant or abiding and a mind that is unabiding is a mind that is completely not grasping ever so for I made a mistake here I forgot a little part of the sutta that is for the, tap, the time of a finger snap. So I'll have to correct that. But uh, that, is, that is cultivating an unabiding mind for the time of a finger snap. And so this is telling us whatever happens, and this is related to the four foundations of mindfulness, the four resting places of awareness also. Because when we are practicing these four, any of these four, if the mind is simply resting upon these, these are simply happening. They're not, we're not necessarily conjuring them to come up, or they, that's why they're so wholesome. We're not forcing the mind to, for example, look at body, or look at sensations, or look at mind. It simply is there. And it's once we take that step back, we we do not abide in there but it's still that whatever that experience is it will simply the mind will simply rest on it and it is completely not grasping and at that time this is also why i wanted to wrap this uh, series of teaching with this sutta is that it also shows us this wonderful uh, gradual uh, importance of these practices and the metta is first uh, before that we can we can put all the brahma viharas i i think in this in this uh, in this previous meritorious act whether it's compassion or joy or equanimity and then either one of the satipatthanas if we truly practice it with the relaxed step letting go, bringing up joy, because this is really what it's saying here. And this is the highest, and by far, the highest merit. And so, whatever can be offered or done or anything, that's always very wonderful. But it's always important to remember that our meditation practice and the state of our mind is always foremost. It is always by far the most important things that we can actually give. This is the highest generosity. And I invite you to do this exercise and to notice this in your life. And this does not take a week. It's a lifetime thing and I'm still doing it <laughs> I'm not, I don't pretend like I 
I, I have a very long lifespan, but um, I'm, I'm definitely practicing in that way. And to seeing, seeing this, this chain, this hierarchy of goodness, of merit, and you'll, you might notice very wonderful things when meditations, meditation comes first. Mental development always comes first in your life. Notice the beauty that will, it will bring into your life. And especially when there's letting go and metta. And these two are very, very, very important. And so on this, uh, I'll stop talking. <laughs> and I will open it up for questions. Yes, go ahead. No, this was a really very uh, beautiful way in which uh, I understood generosity for the first time. Oh. You know, we always think of generosity as something uh, that we give, but this is uh, a different way of looking at uh, generosity. Thank you. Just a comment. Yes. No questions. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Vandami Bhante? Yes, yes. Uh, Bhante, what is your opinion about uh, vegetarianism? Vegetarianism. Yes. I... What I say is that well, of course, there's all these things that the Buddha has said about this, but about eating meat and about not eating meat. What I say is that I prefer that no living beings ever, anywhere, get hurt for anything. <laughs> that is very important. That is our first training rule. I mean, this is, this is so important. And I do not encourage anybody to hurt living beings. In fact, I strongly discourage this. Now, monks, for one thing, we do not choose what we eat, really. We accept what is offered. And by this, this bypasses the karma of, of such uh, offerings, where and especially today, this is uh, this is a very controversial topic, so I'm very careful. <laughs> but um, really, since we do not choose, uh, we're not the ones. Uh, to take on that karma. So the Buddha, that's uh, from my understanding what the Buddha was teaching was that there's, there's some, some ways that we cannot ac accept meat that is uh, given to us. And it is whether we see or heard or suspect this animal was killed in our name for us, to feed us. Then we just cannot accept and that, that is quite clear. The Buddha really makes that line. That is too close. That is too much. But he also saw, a, and you know, at that time, eating meat was a v quite luxurious, I would say. Uh, a lot of people, um, some people thought that it was really um, a luxury. And they would... You know, they would especially serve meat to the Sangha, like, because they thought it was, you know, it was a very special thing. It was a very respectful, you know, uh, like the food of kings or something. So there is, there was at that time, and there still is very uh, controversial debates about this. And, um... A lot of people offer meat and he saw that it would not really uh, be, be right 
to refuse an offering that is done with good intention if it hasn't been killed for them uh, to accept that meat and this is I am explaining this for monks but that is also a, a bit the same for uh, household life if you now there is the karma of killing a living being and there is the karma of buying something at the store for example which are two very different karmas now of course there is an argument that is very strong that is about in, well you buy it at the store that means you are encouraging that industry and all these things this is where I stop and I take a step back <laughs> and I just uh, stick to the Buddha's teaching and what the Buddha said so there is karma of killing a living being and there's karma of uh, buying it at the store but someone for example if I relate to the suttas themselves um, There's many instances where lay people will want to offer meat uh, to the Sangha. Uh, it seems to be a very uh, typical thing. Um, but they also say themselves, but we would never kill <laughs> a living being. So it's, you know, that, that controversy is also in the earliest text 2,600 years ago. So. Uh, that's about that's about what I say about these things and uh, I think that for us to really also practice properly is to remember that this food is um, by our practice of the Dhamma we we need food to keep the body alive and um, sustenance and to live in comfort without overeating but without eating so little that we cannot meditate comfortably and that is much more important I think than uh, whatever that food is and monks are even told that they should be happy uh, and praise eating just scraps <laughs> so so and whenever you're happy with scraps, whenever you're a, a food, whenever you're happy with um, rickety uh, shacks as houses or roots of trees as houses and uh, rag robes to cover your body and, and uh, the, the cow dung and the fermented urine as medicine there's not much that can get in the way of your happiness so I think the Buddha made the point on this <laughs> so I, I, I recommend this for everybody <laughs> Well, I mean, the business in meat means killing. <laughs> so he did ban this. He did say, do not. Yes, he, he definitely banned the... He said, not, you shouldn't have a profession that is uh, rooted upon hurting living beings. So... Food is only to 
to give us strength to purify the mind, to do good deeds. And uh, not hurting living beings, that's all I can say. <laughs> not hurting, practicing, making the most of what we take, making the most and making it exponential and giving. And I gave you this wonderful I, the Buddha gave us. <laughs> this wonderful uh, sutta here, this discourse, to tell us what is the highest thing we can give. And so by knowing this, now we can actually, whatever it is that we use for eating to maintain our body, uh, then we can take that and make it even better to benefit the universe. I, I, I would like to uh, just add one point to the previous discussion. That it's considered that uh, vegetarians' uh, food is uh, equal to not killing anybody. That's a misconcept because even vegetarian food production leads to killing of uh, bacteria in the soil and some earthworms and many other uh, living beings. So I think uh, this uh, debate itself is uh, pointless as long as we understand that food is only to sustain. Yes. I, that's, that's my uh, yes. take on that. Yes. I fully agree. Thank you about that. I was a gardener in uh, lay life uh, in a big, big greenhouse, organic greenhouse. And um, I know very well that uh, this profession is about killing thousands and thousands of many living beings because we cannot, it's impossible. We just cannot have any kind of food without uh, it's called pest management, <laughs> but uh, it's not the slaughter of bigger animals. But if we don't have these things, well, there's, I mean, there is no crop. There is no, so it's, uh, yes, it's an interesting thing. <laughs> Thank you, Bhante. Good. Hi, Patrick. I see you just joined us. <laughs> Good. Good. Today, Bonte. <laughs> Good. Today from Australia. Oh, that's where you are. Uh, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, when you live in Nelson, it's, I think it's quite easy to be a Buddhist. Um, my question for you is how do you be a good Buddhist when you live in a, a country that's 90% um, full of tattooed rednecks <laughs> oh so I'd like advice on how to be a Buddhist when you live in a huge city um full of uh, every temptation possible. Yes. That's my question for you. Mm -hmm. Well, I first send you all of my metta. <laughs> and... Um, I am meditating on the beach. Though. Yes. Good. Good. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yes, if, if you can find the quiet, beautiful place. In fact, you know, the, the Buddha, when he found his, uh, the place he, uh, near the Naranjaya, Naranjara River, the Bodhi tree, he saw that place and he thought that was a very beautiful and inspiring place, perfect for meditation and I'm sure you can find a good place in Australia somewhere 
by the beach or something that inspires you and that brings joy in your heart and that can kind of keep you safe and um, emotionally and when you can have a bit of uh, of a space of kind of an impression of spaciousness and a little bit of a, a place where you can find your your own your own little place for meditation or any kind of peaceful place can be in the park or something and of course well I would tell you I would say can't you find a monastery I thought that you would find a monastery there <laughs> So <laughs> I thought you would be quite well supported. So you're taking me a little bit uh, off guard. No, I'm very well supported. <laughs> okay, uh, good. I, I even bought a, a fly net so I can meditate under the fly net. Oh, good. So things are perfect. <laughs> good, good. I'm happy to hear yeah. that. I just wanted to say hi. Yes, good. Good to see you. Okay. Yes. And then I would like to add something uh, yes. to the last uh, conversation that we had. Yes. Uh, that we were having. Yes. So it's about the instrument. You know, there is a Sutta uh, that uh, Buddha talks about the uh, nutriment, the four nutriments. And in the nutriments about the, to the body, he talks about a couple that takes uh, their son across a desert and then all their food gets over and they get lost in the desert. And uh, when he talks about them killing the child to partake of the meat, and uh, he asks his... Uh, can you put it off? Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so he talks about the child, uh, you know, them killing the child and then partake of his... And he asks his world whether uh, they will partake this meat out of pleasure, uh, out of the joy of uh, eating it, uh, about its taste, or would they partake it, uh, you know, with uh, tears and giving the um, blessing for, you know, the, the nutriment to sustain their body. So I, I just had this thought that um, when we eat our food, you know, you don't think about it as a, something pleasurable, like if you can eat food without craving, if you can eat the food without um, thinking about how pleasurable it is, and just about thinking about how it sustains you, then probably whatever you eat would not matter. So I, I, when I read the sutta, that was what I thought. So I thought I will just uh, put my two pennies. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And this line of thought, I uh it can go pretty pretty uh pretty far into uh, uh pr profoundly uh, into understanding the nature of, of samsara in in a way uh when we when we really think about where the that food comes from and how all of these things you know it's it's often it's enough to just grow a lot of uh, a strong dose of reality right there to uh, understand that okay so for me to eat there's got to be something you know there's got to be something that goes so um so yes <laughs> so this uh, whether that that example is a bit uh is a bit uh it's one of the most you know very clear uh, strong example uh, that the Buddha uses uh, but uh, we can we can definitely see that in in everything and this really supports humility also and uh, well just recollecting this every time that we eat and what we also give back what is it that we give back 
that's a good. So actually, I am a vegetarian by birth, but and so I do not eat any non-veg. But when I read the Sutta, I left all pride at being a vegetarian. <laughs> I realized that it's not the food that I eat, but it's what I, how much uh, attachment I have to. Thank you. Yes, good. Good remark. Okay. Good. Well. If there is no other questions, we will share merits and I will let you go. Uh, what was the sutta today? We joined late because the link was changed today and also password was changed. Oh, okay. I think Marty put it in the chat, I think. This is Vailama Sutta. It's in the An Guttara Nikaya. It's uh, in the in the books of nine book of nines, and it's the twentieth. It's available on the Thank website. You. Yes, good, good. Bante, <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I joined very late. No I problem. Other work. Uh, my question is related to Dana. Yes. Uh, for example, if somebody does uh, dana, and there are many cases like one one can do dana and he thinks that he had done good dana, and be happy with uh, happy about what dana he had done, and another person just does dana and just forgets about what he had done, and maybe another person uh, maybe he he does dana but after giving dana he. He thinks, oh, why I had done that dana? So, do you think that uh, the result of this dana are different for these different situations? Yes. Different people, how they think? Yes. Literally, punya is the state of the mind. It's uh, one should always offer. Before offering, the mind should be uplifted. That's what the Buddha said. It should be happy. It should be happy to prepare the offering. It should be happy to know that it will be giving. And uh, while offering, it should be uplifted. It should know that when it is giving, it, it will bear fruit and it will, uh, it will help and the mind is uplifted. And after looking back, it should be uplifted, knowing that it has offered. And see, the important part part hit is here, be, just being happy, having an uplifted, bright mind, because that is the power of dana. For example, before I became a monk, I was serving for a long time at a meditation center and um, that is not or, or monasteries or whenever I served Sangha the mind the power of the dana because it was for me, it was special. It was a very wonderful opportunity, and to uh, to support sangha and to support these monks, and to to really help. This is a kind of happiness that stays for a very long time. It it's not blown away easily. It's not, uh, and it's not. It's. It's for the wise. It's for someone who understands happiness and how it works and how dana is for uplifting the mind. It's, uh, it's one thing to give dana and I mean I'm trying to explain it in another way that, that I've explained it with this very sutta. I'm not sure if you were there for the sutta because I've... I've I, yeah, I joined with it. Oh, okay. I follow it 
no problem no problem just i yes that's what i talked a bit more in this sutta in the sutta so um that is the power of dana and whenever whenever we do these deeds for example we we and that is why offering to sangha is quite powerful because uh these people they choose to maintain a very very um very a life oriented around the good and it's not easy there's so many rules and all these things but and the only way that they can do that is also by being supported and so it's a bit um it's mutual so it's very it's very uplifting to be able to be part of that and when we look back onto these actions well these are just really wonderful things that are really uplifting our minds and i say this example that's the first example that came to my mind for example because this is my own experience and yours is maybe different for many many things but remembering anything that you've done to help or that was genuine that was really you meant it that you really wanted to help and you did it out of love and out of compassion these are very powerful memories that will uplift your mind and make you a very happy person and support you through everything that you live and so yes the state of the mind while giving is everything <laughs> good thank you bante thank you for clarifying good Okay. Okay, let's share our merits. Dukkha patta jani dukkha bhaya patta jani bhaya sukha patta jani sukha hantu sabbe pipani no idang no punyang sabbe satta numodantu sabba sampatti siddhiya Akasatta ca bhumatta devanaga mahidika punyang tang anumoritwa chirang rakkantu buddha sasasanam May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. Be happy and have a wonderful week. do good deeds and hopefully all blessings are with you uh of the three the triple gem the blessing of the triple gem follow you and uh i will see you next week